So you mentioned that Moji is a superset of Python. Can you run Python code as if it's Mojo code? Yes. <laughs> yes. So and so and this has two sides of it. So Mojo's not done yet. So I'll give you a disclaimer. Mojo's yes. not done yet. But already we see people that take small pieces of Python code, move it over, they don't change it, and you can get 12x speedups. Mm -hmm. Like somebody was just tweeting about that yesterday, which is pretty cool, right? And again, interpreters, compilers, right? And so without changing any code, without also this is not with this is not JIT compiling or doing any anything fancy. This is just basic stuff, move it straight over. Now, Mojo will continue to grow out, and as it grows out, it will have more and more and more features, and our North Star is to be a full superset of Python, and so you can bring over basically arbitrary Python code and have it just work. And it may not always be 12x faster, but um, but it should be at least as fast and way faster in many cases is the goal, right? Um, now, it'll take time to do that, and Python is a complicated language. There's not just the obvious things, but there's also non-obvious things that are complicated, like we have to be able to talk to CPython packages that talk to the C API, and there's, there's a bunch of there's a bunch of pieces to this. So you have to, I mean, just to make explicit the obvious, that may not be so obvious until you think about it. So, you know, to run Python code, that means you have to run all the Python packages and libraries. Yeah, yeah. So that means what? What's the relationship between uh, Mojo and CPython, the, the, the interpreter that yep. presumably would be tasked with getting those packages to work? Yep, so in the fullness of time, Mojo will solve for all the problems and you'll be able to move py Python packages over and run them in Mojo. Without the CPython. Without CPython, someday. Yeah. Right, so not today, but That's someday. Cool. And that'll be a beautiful day because then you'll get a whole bunch of advantages and you'll get massive speed ups and things like this. But you can do that one at a time, right? You can move packages one at a time. Exactly, but, but we're not willing to wait for that. <laughs> Python is too important, the ecosystem is too broad. Uh, we wanna both be able to build Mojo out. We also wanna do it the right way without time, like in, without intense time pressure, we're obviously moving fast, but, um, and so what we do is we say, okay, well, let's make it so you can import an arbitrary existing package, arbitrary, including like you write your own on your local disk you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not like a standard pack, like an arbitrary package and import that using CPython. Mm -hmm. Cause CPython already runs all the packages, right? And so what we do is we built an integration layer where we can actually use CPython. Again, I'm practical mm -hmm. <laughs> and to actually just load and use all the existing packages as they are. The downside of that is you don't get the benefits of Mojo for those packages, mm -hmm. right? And so they'll run as fast as they do in the traditional CPython way. But what that does is that gives you an incremental migration path. And so if you say, hey, cool, well, here's a, you know, the Python ecosystem is vast. I want all of it to just work. Mm -hmm. But there's certain things that are really important. And so if, I, if I'm doing weather forecasting or something, <laughs> well, I want to be able to load all the data. I want to be able to work with it. And then I have my own crazy algorithm inside of it. Well, normally I'd write that in C++. If I can write in Mojo and have one system that scales, well, that's way easier to work with. Is it hard to do that, to, to have that layer that's running C Python? Because is there some communication back and forth? Yes, it's complicated. Um, okay. I mean, this, this is what we do. So, I mean, we make it look easy, but um, it is it is complicated. But what, what we do is we use the C Python existing interpreter. So it's running its own bytecodes and that's how it provides full compatibility. And then it gives us C Python objects mm -hmm. and we use those objects as is. And so that way we're fully compatible with all the C Python objects and all the, the, you know, it's not just the Python part, it's also the C packages, the C libraries underneath them because they're often hybrid. And so we can fully run and we're fully compatible with all that. And the way we do that is that we have to play by the rules, right? And so we, we keep objects in that representation when they're coming from that world. What's the representation that's yeah. being used? In memory. We'd have to know a lot about how the C Python interpreter works. It has, for example, reference counting, but also different rules on how to pass pointers around and things like this. Super low level fiddly, and it's not like Python, it's like how the interpreter works, okay? And so that gets all exposed out, and then you have to define wrappers around the low level C code, right? And so what this means is you have to know not only C, which is a different world from Python, obviously, not only Python. But the wrappers. 
but the interpreter and the wrappers and the implementation details and the conventions, and it's just this really complicated mess. Yeah. And when you do that, now suddenly you have a debugger that debugs Python, they can't step into C code. Mm -hmm. So you have this two world problem, mm -hmm. right? And so by pulling this all into Mojo, what you get is you get one world. You get the ability to say, cool, I have untyped, very dynamic, beautiful, simple code. Okay, I care about performance for whatever reason, right? There's lots of reasons you could you you might care. And so then you add types, you can parallelize things, you can vectorize things, you can use these techniques, which are general techniques to solve a problem. And then you can do that by staying in the system. And if you're uh, you have that that one Python package that's really important to you, you can move it to Mojo. You get massive performance benefits on that, and, that, and other other advantages. You know, if you like stack types, it's nice if they're enforced. <laughs> Some people like that, right? Rather than being hints. So there's other advantages too. And then um, and then you can do that incrementally as you go. So one different perspective on this would be. Uh... Why Mojo instead of making C Python faster or redesigning C Python? Yeah, well, I mean, you could argue Mojo is redesigning yeah. C Python, but yes. but uh, but why not make C Python faster and better and other things like that? Uh, there's lots of people working on that. So actually, there's a team at Microsoft that is really improving. I think C Python three point eleven came out in October or something like that, and it was you know fifteen percent faster, twenty percent faster across the board. Which is pretty huge, yeah, given how huge. mature Python mm -hmm. is and things like this. And so um, that's awesome. I love it. Um, it doesn't run on GPU. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't do AI stuff. Like it doesn't do vectors. Doesn't do things. Um, I'm twenty percent is good. Thirty five thousand times is better, yeah. right? <laughs> so like they're 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 definitely. I'm a huge fan of that work, by the way, and it composes well with what we're doing. And so it's not. It's not like we're fighting or anything like that. It's actually just general. It's goodness for the world, but it's just a different path, right? And again, we're not working forwards from making Python a little bit better. We're working backwards from what is the limit of physics. What's the process of uh, porting Python code to Mojo? Is there um, what's involved in that in that yeah. process? Is there tooling for that? Not yet. So um, we're missing some basic features right now. And so we're continuing to drop out new features like on a weekly basis. But, um, you know, at the, at the fullness of time, give us a year and a half, maybe two years. Is it an automatable process? So it, when, when we're ready, it'll be very automatable. Yes. Is it automatable? Automa like, is it possible to automate in the general case, the yeah. Python to Mojo conversion? Yeah. Well, you, and, you're and, saying it's possible. Well, so, and this is why. I mean, among other reasons why we use tabs. Yes. Right. So, first of all, by being a superset, yep. you can, it's, it's like C versus C. Mm -hmm. Can you move C code to C? Yes. Yeah. Right. And you move, you, you can move C code to C, and uh, then you can adopt classes. You can adopt templates. You can adopt other references or whatever C features you want mm -hmm. after you move C, to, C code to C. Like, you can't use templates in C. Mm -hmm. Right, and so if you leave it as C, fine. You can't use the cool features, but it still works, right? And C and C plus plus code work together, and so that's the analogy, right? Now, um, here, right, you, 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 uh, there, there's not a Python is bad and a Mojo is good, <laughs> right? Mojo just gives you superpowers, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you want to stay with Python, that's cool, uh, but the tooling should be actually very beautiful and simple because we're doing the hard work of defining a superset. Right, so you're right. So there's several things to say there, but also the conversion tooling should probably give you hints as to like how you can improve the code. And then you, yeah, exactly. Once you're in the new world, then you can build all kinds of cool tools to say like, hey, should you adopt this feature or like, and we haven't built those tools yet, but I fully expect those tools will exist. And then you can like, you know, quote unquote, modernize your code or however you want to look at it, right? So, I mean, one of the things that I think is really interesting about Mojo is that there have been a lot of projects to improve Python over the years. Um, everything from you know getting jo uh, Python to run on the Java virtual machine, uh, PyPy, which is a JIT compiler. There's tons of these projects out there that have been working on improving Python in various ways. They fall into one of two camps. So PyPy is a great example of a camp that is trying to be compatible with Python. Even there, not really. It doesn't work with all the C packages and stuff like that. But um, but they're trying to be compatible with Python. There's also another category of these things where they're saying, well, Python is too complicated. <laughs> and you know, I'm gonna cheat on the edges and it, you know, like integers, 
in Python can be an arbitrary size integer. Like if you care about it fitting in a going fast in a register in a computer, that's really annoying, mm-hmm. right? And so you can you can do, choose two paths on that, right? You can say, well, people don't really use big integers that often, therefore I'm going to just not do it and it'll be fine. Yeah. Not not a Python superset. Yeah. <laughs> or you can do the hard thing and say, okay, this is Python. And you can't be a superset of Python without being a superset of Python. And that's a really hard technical problem, but it's, in my opinion, worth it, right? And it's worth it because it's not about any one package. It's about this ecosystem. It's about what Python means for the world. And it also means we don't want to repeat the Python 2 to Python 3 transition. Like, we want, we want people to be able to adopt this stuff quickly. And so by doing that work, we can help lift people. Yeah, the challenge, it's really interesting, technical philosophical challenge of really making a language a superset of another language. That's breaking my brain a little bit. Well, well it, it paints you into corners. So um, again, I'm very happy with Python. Right? So joking, all joking aside, I think that the indentation thing is not the actual important part of the problem. Yes. <laughs> right? But the the fact that Python has amazing dynamic metaprogramming features mm-hmm. and they translate to beautiful static metaprogramming features, I think is profound. Mm-hmm. I think that's huge, right? And so Python, I, I've talked with Guido about this. It's it's like, it, it was not designed to do what we're doing. That was not the reason they built it this way, but because they really cared and they were very thoughtful about how they designed the language, it scales very elegantly in the space. But if you look at other languages, for example, C and C++, right? If you're building a superset, you get stuck with the design decisions of the subset, right? And so, you know, C++ is way more complicated because of C in the legacy Mm -hmm. than it would have been if they would have theoretically designed a from scratch thing. And there's lots of people right now that are trying to make C++ better and re-syntax C++. It's going to be great. We'll just change all the syntax. Uh, but if you do that now, suddenly you have zero packages. You don't have compatibility. So what? What are the? If you could just uh, linger on that, what are the biggest challenges of keeping that superset status? What are the things you're struggling with? Is it all boiled down to having a big integer? No, I mean it's it's, a, it's <laughs> what it, are the other things like? Usually, usually it's the um, it's the long tail weird things. So l- l- let me give you a war story. Okay. So war story yeah. in the space is um, you go way back in time. Project I worked on is called Clang. Mm-hmm. Clang, what it is, is a C, C++ parser, right? And when I started working on Clang, it must have been like 2006 or something, was when I, 2007, 2006, when I first started working on it, right? Um, it's funny how time flies. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I started that project and I'm like, okay, well, I want to build a C parser, C++ parser for LLVM. It's going to be the wor- GCC is yucky. You know, this is me and earlier times. It's yucky. It's unprincipled. It has all these weird features, like all these bugs, like it's yucky. So I'm going to build a standard compliant C and C++ parser. It's going to be beautiful. It'll be amazing, well-engineered, all the cool things an engineer wants to do. And so I started implementing and building it out and building it out and building it out. And then I got to include standard (laughs) IO.h. And all of the headers in the world use all the GCC stuff. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Yeah. This and so again, come back away from theory back to reality, right? I, I had I was at a fork in the road. I could have built an amazingly beautiful academic thing that nobody would ever use. Or I could say, well, it's yucky in various ways. Uh, all these design mistakes, accents of history, the legacy at that point GCC was like over 20 years old, which by the way, yeah. now, now LVM's over 20 years old, yep. right? And so it's funny how <laughs> yep. time catch, catches up to you, right? And so um, you, you you say, okay, well, what, what what is easier, right? I mean, as an engineer, it's it's actually much easier for me to go implement long tail compatibility weird features, even if they're distasteful, and just do the hard work and like figure it out, reverse engineer it, understand what it is, write a bunch of test cases, like try to understand the behavior. It's way easier to do all that work as an engineer than it is to go talk to all C programmers and get argue with them and try to get them to rewrite their code. Yeah. Right. And because that breaks a lot more things. Yeah. And and you have realities like nobody actually even understands how the code works because it was written by the person who quit 10 years ago. <laughs> right. And so this this software is kind of frustrating that way, but it's 
that's how the world works. Right? Yeah, unfortunately, it can never be this perfect, beautiful thing. Well, there, there, there are occasions in which you get to build, like, you know, you invent a new data structure or something like that. Or there's this beautiful algorithm that just, yeah. like, makes you super happy. And I, I, I love that moment. But, but when you're working with people, yeah. and you're working with code and dusty deck code bases and things like this, right? It's not about what's theoretically beautiful. It's about what's practical, what's real, what people will actually use. And I don't meet a lot of people that say, I want to rewrite all my code just for the sake of it. Mm-hmm. By the way, there could be interesting possibilities, and we'll probably talk about it, where AI can help rewrite some code. That might be farther out future, but it's a really interesting one, yeah. how that could create more, yeah. be a, a tool in the battle against this monster of complexity that you mentioned. Yeah. 